All right, so today, um, some of this stuff will be new and some of this stuff could be reviewed. This might be the first place where it's more, uh, we're getting into stuff that, um, I don't know, you may have had before in the class or maybe not. I'll try to go through it, you know, at a reasonable pace, but if you have any questions as I'm talking about it, let me know. Um, and I was also looking at the videos and I noticed my voice is kind of blurry. I'll try to talk a little bit more um, clearly, but partly it's because we mess. So anyway, if you remember last time we talked about chemical potential, that's what we ended up. Right, that's the um, partial derivative of the Gibbs free energy for changes in moles of chemical reactions in a chemical reaction. So we use chemical potential in one way today, which is to look at solubility. But we're going to talk about solubility between minerals. And there's kind of two categories. One is trace element substitution, meaning putting in a trace constituent. And the other is solid solutions. And you'll see what we mean by both of those coming up. And then after we finish that, I want to move into the discussion of what we call non-ideality. The POI here. Sorry about that. Um, and we'll look at it briefly as a concept, and then you know, make some examples of how it works in gases, especially high pressure, and how it works in aqueous mixtures. All right. So if you think about solubility, right, a lot of people have the immediate thing that comes to mind is putting sugar in your coffee in the morning or salt in your soup or something like that. And that is a really common way that we all interact with solubility. How stuff dissolves in water or how stuff dissolves in gases um, and the kinds of mixtures that come from that. And not only can you have something like putting a little bit of sugar in your coffee, you can also have chemicals that mix perfectly like uh, water and ethanol, right? So you can mix them in different proportions. So those are a kind of solubility. But in the earth sciences, we use other kinds of solubility as well as those, we use those. But we also use um, solubility in the solid state, okay? And so I want to talk about that a little bit today. And we can use chemical potential to help understand how the solubility progresses in its back because some of the partial molar values for things, that, remember we talked about that last time, that's the um, value of whatever gives free energy or entropy or volume or whatever of a substance that is dependent upon a component of it. Um, those, the, both of those things um, vary as a function um, of what a mixture is made of when we have a mixture and those mixtures may have different ways they respond if we change the temperature or the pressure. So we can use those things like, oh, changing um, values of equilibrium constants in mixtures to say something about temperature and pressure or some other system variable that we want to talk about in the past. So this is why we use mixtures a lot. They're common in petrology. They're common in um, low temperature processes like uh, paleoceanography, and I'll give you, like I say, a couple of examples. So the two things we're going to talk about, as I mentioned on the first slide, trace element substitution and solid solutions. So solid solutions, we've used this example once before, magnesium-rich olivine, iron-rich olivine. What we actually find in nature is a mixture of these materials that is mixed at the molecular level, not like a physical mixture, but you know, we can get any fraction of magnesium or iron in whatever proportion. We get a single mineral phase, changes its properties a little bit as a function of how much of this or this is in there. But these things mix completely with each other and in a pressure independent way. So um, the first thing that, that we'll talk about is trace element substitution. And we can use it to examine you know, lots of different things. As we talked briefly at the end last time, for instance, the substitution of a like group of elements like the alkaline metals and the alkaline earths into feldspar, or using the olivine example that we were just talking about. If you look at where iron is on the pyramid chart, some of these other elements that are around it, such as cobalt and nickel, also substitute in for iron into that matrix. 
and in trace amounts so they don't affect the energy of the mixture because they're there in trace constituents so we use chemical potential arguments to kind of figure out like um how the concentration varies um, as a function of all of the various other things they're substituting in and where they're substituting in from so for instance in the case of the igneous mineral the minerals forming from a magma they're substituting in from the magma and we can even look at the temperature and pressure dependence of these things and say something sometimes about those conditions so the chemical potential if you recall from last time which is written with the letter mu of any chemical I, whatever, um, is the pure state. Um, and this is a little bit different than the standard state. So it has an asterisk instead of a zero up there, um, plus gas constant and temperature times the natural log of a mole fraction of I. Does everyone remember what a mole fraction is? Mole fraction is the fraction of moles of some chemical relative to all of the things in that system, right? So in the case of within the mineral that um, we're substituting in an example I'm giving here, basically, let's say we have uh, 10 different elements that are substituting into a site. Um, each individual element will have a mole fraction and the total will be all the possible things that can substitute, right? So all of the substitutable sites that are uh, present. And for the most case, in trace all the substitution, these mole fractions are really small. Right, they're like a tiny fraction of the total. So this is a chemical potential of the material if it were pure of the chemical I, whatever I is, right? It's the, the pure phase chemical potential. So um, because, as I was just mentioning, the solubility of many trace elements into minerals is at such a small level, it doesn't really affect the energy to a first order of that mineral lattice. Um, it does it to a second order, but to a first order, let's just assume it doesn't for now. Then we can assume that the fraction, when we're doing the mole fraction, the fraction of something like, for instance, cobalt into a mineral, right, is small compared to the total. So when we write out the mole fraction, we can think about it a slightly different way, assuming that this value here, okay, is one, right? The mole fraction of everything else that isn't cobalt is basically one. And I've got a conversion here from mole fraction, which is number of, of you know atoms or moles of I over the total into activities, um, which is basically expressed as a concentration to be able to set this thing as one. So um, this new cobalt, this term here, would be the chemical potential of cobalt in phase I. So here's an example. Let's say we have some phytite and some hornblende, they're in a rock, and we determine they're in chemical equilibrium. Maybe we determine this by looking under a microscope and looking at their textures. Maybe we do it compositionally. Many elements can exchange between phytite and hornblende, but for the example of just cobalt, okay, at chemical equilibrium, chemical potential variations go to zero, so that the amount of cobalt substituting from um, biotite into hornblende and the amount going from hornblende into biotite is fixed. So those are equal to each other and they're set by the equilibrium constant, and their ratio is one. So there's a bunch of algebra on here that to which derive something called the Henry's Law distribution coefficient or the partition coefficient that governs the exchange of cobalt between biotite and blood. And the, the bottom thing down here is there's a constant which for every single mineral pair and for every single element that's substituting in is different. It's also different as a function of temperature and pressure. But the basic expression is, is that the activity of cobalt over the uh, in biotite or the activity called hormone is a constant. And here's where I got that from. I basically took this equation, right, where this stuff equals one, and then I substituted in this for this twice, right, in red and in blue. That's just this expression, 
in this expression are basically that and that from the previous page, but specific to biotite and corn blend. And then I just did some fancy algebra. I rearranged a bunch of stuff and then I realized, hey, you know, at constant temperature, a bunch of this stuff dropped out as constant, right? R is obviously constant, it's universal gas constant. T is a constant um, when we call make our system isothermal. And these values, these views of the pure phases, right? Um, these are also constants, something that can be looked up in the book. So I throw all those constants together into C1 and C2. They're just, this is just for algebra purposes, right? These are basically a combination of all the other constants rolled into one. And I keep doing a bunch more algebra to come up with um, this expression that says C2 over C1, which is a constant, is the natural log of this expression. I take the E to both sides, the exponent to both sides. And so E to the C2 to C1 equals K which basically tells us that all of these parameters from chemical potential boil down to telling us that there is a constant at a specific temperature that governs that partition. So, and I, I just put this down here. I, you know, I, I kind of assume that everyone remembers this log, uh, algebra of logarithms, natural, algebra of natural logs um, and exponents, all that kind of stuff. But if you're rusty on that stuff, brush up on it or ask me questions. Um, but I just, like I say, kind of assume that you just know that. Yeah. Wait, I'm sorry, what is the A? What a is activity. It's, it's activity. less concentration, oh, but it's a okay. real effective, yeah, activity. Gotcha, okay. And so it's usually expressed in concentration units of some kind or another. I see, okay. Because it says like, like A total, so the total activity yeah. is around one? For everything, right. So that's because the um, amount of cobalt that is substituted into that site is so small that when we're looking at mole fractions and we're thinking about one thing relative to everything else, that everything else effectively becomes one. It's almost like the okay. pure phase. Okay, so this equilibrium constant is sometimes called a KD. You'll hear people like you go to talks at conferences and you'll say, oh, the KD of this or that. And that's what they're talking about. They're talking about trace element exchange between minerals, usually. Sometimes people call it um, a distribution coefficient. Sometimes people call it a partition coefficient. And sometimes people call it a Henry's law distribution coefficient. They're all different words for the same thing. And the only reason people sometimes throw in that Henry's law is it's, it's got the same form as Henry's law, which I've written out here, which is the partial pressure of the gas over the number of moles of that gas that's dissolved in water when they're in equilibrium. That's what Henry's law originally was. And it's basically got, obviously got the same form. It's a, you know, activity of one thing over another, activity of one thing over another. So um, you say, well, what about non-ideality, which we're gonna talk about later <coughs> uh, coming up today. And it is true that in many cases, Unless the thing that is substituting into a mineral lattice is exactly the same charge and size, it's going to disrupt the mineral a little bit. Okay, and we have a way of predicting this. It has to do with the strain, a calculation of the strain that's imposed on a lattice that allows us to figure out how this equilibrium constant might vary because of all the other stuff substituting in and the temperature and the pressure and the rate of growth and all this kind of stuff. We're not going to talk about it right now. When we get to igneous processes later in the semester, we'll talk about how these things are determined. And for many, many years, meaning, I don't know, probably 50 years, people did this um, by making measurements, just putting stuff together and assuming chemical equilibrium and then measuring what was present. And that works okay. And then maybe starting about 15 years ago, this lattice strain model way of kind of making a secondary correction um, came came to be. And so, like I said, we'll talk about that as we come up. The non-ideality examples I want to give you later today are easier than that one. So now the other kind of mixture are what we call solid solutions. Two solids together, phosphorite, phthalite example I gave before is one. Another one is biotite and um, garnet. Okay. So both of these things can be written out as um, basically these generalized equations. 
right? Where z, there's no element z in the pair chart. Z is just like a variable. Z can be a bunch of different stuff, right? And I'm just going to give you a simple example here where we look at the exchange and mixing between mica and garnet for two elements, magnesium and iron, both substituting into that Z spot. Okay. So the term, the names for these things, when this Z is magnesium, we call that mineral flogotite. When that mineral is iron, we call it anionite. Excuse me, when that, that substituting space. We come over to garnet. Um, again, same kind of thing. When we substitute magnesium in for the spot called Z, the end number mineral called pyrope. And when it's iron, it's called almond D. These names are totally unimportant. But just like phosphorite, phthalate in the olivine system, these two things are found as mixtures in nature. Right, so if we pick up a real piece of garnet, it's going to have some fraction of pyrope, some fraction of almondine in a perfect mixture, and the same thing for the bias. Okay, there'll be a mixture. There's some other elements that can substitute in for these things as well, especially calcium and titanium, and they have different names. I'm just keeping this simple for the sake of showing you how chemical potential works. So we can write out a chemical reaction, right? Where, and I have the reaction on the next page, but where in essence, we put some mica and some garnet next to each other in a metamorphic rock. They're stewing around and doing their thing, exchanging chemicals until we get to some end member um, situation where we've got a mixture of these two things in our mica and a mixture of these two things in our garnet. And we can calculate what that equilibrium constant is on the basis of the activities or the ratio of activities of the two things in both cases, and it's another kind of distribution. A little bit different than trace element distribution, because in this case, these are major constituents of the phase and they affect this energetics. So we have to think about how we use this information. It's a little bit different than what we would do with the trace element substitution. Nevertheless, it's a useful way to think about these solid solutions. So here's the chemical reaction. It's basically garnet that's got magnesium in it, right? Reacts with biotite that's got iron in it to make some garnet with iron in it and some biotite with magnesium in it, right? It doesn't all go one way or the other. The materials that we find in our mixture, this is how it's written out with the actual chemical formula, okay? And so we can write the equilibrium constant in this case expressing it as the relative activity of iron in the garnet, right? And the relative activity of magnesium in the biotite as products over reactants, the activity of magnesium in the garnet and the activity of iron in the biotite. And that's where that KD or KEQ comes from, okay? It's just a simple expression of that exchange as a function function of assuming that all the energetics come from just the, the in, in this particular case, the exchange of iron and magnesium between these two mineral phases. So you're like, well, why do I care about that stuff? Well, the reason we care about that stuff is it turns out that most thermodynamic properties that um, affect chemicals, so especially the enthalpy and the entropy, vary with temperature and pressure, okay? This is a general expression, it doesn't have anything to do with mixtures. This is basically something that's derived for pretty much any chemical mixing or chemical situation where we have a chemical reaction, which is this that if we keep the pressure constant on the system, the change in an equilibrium constant with respect to temperature, and we're looking at the, the law, natural law of the equilibrium constant, is the change in enthalpy over RT squared. This is just an expression that people have worked out. Um, over time, and that's for what we call isobaric, constant pressure situation, okay? And so what that tells us is if we want to look at the temperature dependence of an equilibrium constant, right, um, at two different states, let's say, you know, if we're talking about an igneous system, 1,000 degrees and 1,200 degrees, something like that, then we would know that the variation in equilibrium constant between those two states is basically this one over the two different temperatures 
times the change in Detroit, uh, excuse me, change in enthalpy over um, the universal gas constant. Obviously, some of these things we either have to measure or we have to look them up because you're not going to typically find all of these things in a table. And so instead, it basically tells us that the variation in equilibrium constant is a function of temperature. It's basically one over the temperature. And this will become useful um, in a second. I'll show you how. People make measurements of exchanges, and then they have uh, different temperatures, and they apply this formalism to it, figure out a parameterization, and then they can predict one temperature um, by knowing the other temperature if they're looking at a system with um, uncertain temperature. There's also a condition where if we keep it, our system isothermal, meaning constant temperature, there's also a relationship of how equilibrium constant varies with pressure, where the D of the natural log of K over DP is just a change in volume over RT. And so again, that, that one might be a little bit more intuitive. You know, as you increase the pressure, you could see uh, obviously things are going to compress and compact and, and um, and they do. And so that's why we get a change in volume as the primary thing that varies. And you might say, why is the natural log in there? If, if, remember, if you go back to what we were talking about with Gibbs free energy, right, it is equal to an expression that includes the natural log of the equilibrium constant. These are generic equations. You don't have to memorize them. They're things that can be derived. They're derived in the, in the reading. They're derived in thermodynamics textbooks. All I want you to know is that we can use the variation in temperature or in pressure um, as thermometers and barometers that tell us the mixtures of minerals, what the temperature they may have formed in. So that's why we use them. Okay, so um, when we use minerals in nature, and whether we assume chemical equilibrium or not, um, to try and suss out the conditions of pressure and temperature that those minerals formed at. We call it either geothermometry or geobarometry. And in some cases, we can do them together, and then people call it uh, geothermobarometry, you know, where both of those variables are changed. And there's three kinds of chemical reactions that are used as these pressure temperature indicators. One of them is solid solutions, like we were just discussing, like that garnet by type one. Another one is phase boundary changes. And we'll look at an example of that in a second. And the third one is phase absolution, which I've mentioned a couple of times before. Um, basically, as uh, many that you can find many examples where mixtures aren't pure mixtures at high temperature, the phases stay mixed together, and as things cool down, they unmix. And a great example of that are um, sodic and potassium feldspars. As they cool down below a certain point, the phases separate out and we get lamellae with different compositions. And so if we find minerals that don't have that unmixing, we recognize that they froze in place at a higher temperature um, before that unmixing uh, took place. We won't really talk about this example too much, but I do want to go through A and B uh, quickly here. And these again are there in the book. So if we look at the garnet and biotite example that we we're just talking about, right? You said we had a distribution coefficient. It's just the ratio of the activities of iron to magnesium and garnet and um, iron to magnesium and biotite. And that's a geothermometer where the natural log of K is proportional to one over T. And you're like, ah, where does that come from? It comes from this right here. Okay. This expression. The natural log of this thing is proportional to one over T. That's just the, the version of this written out for um, you know, a constant, a single temperature interval, but more generally. And so we can measure these activities in a bunch of mixtures at different T's, and we can fit a line through it, right? And then we can use compositions to tell us something about temperature in unknown. This is kind of an imperfect example, especially because, as I mentioned before, there are other things besides iron and magnesium, magnesium that substitute into these sites. There's calcium, there's titanium, et cetera, et cetera. But this is for the purposes of simplicity. I, I boil this down, and so, and so has White in the book, to just an iron and magnesium exchange, just so you kind of know, you know what, how this work is done. So this is that same KD. It's the ratio of iron to magnesium and garnet. 
and the ratio of iron to magnesium and biotite. And these are three different people's parameterizations. They measured it in their lab, right? Lab one, lab two, lab three, their reference over here. These are measurements made in the seventies. Um, yeah, they're not exactly the same, but they're pretty close, right? They basically tell us that as a function of one over temperature times 10 to the fourth, right? So this is a temperature variation. As this number goes up, the temperature is going down, right? Because it's in the denominator. So temperature is highest over here. So at high temperature, we get a mineral that basically favors the reactions over the products as written. And at lower temperature, we favor the products over the reactants. And so it gives us some idea that the ratio of iron to magnesium in a mixture of garnet and bikite at chemical equilibrium has a temperature dependence that we might be able to use to pick up a rock and say, well, what is that ratio? And therefore, what temperature did it form? Does that make sense? Okay. And so this kind of what we call parameterization is pretty common in the geosciences where we have an expression that tells us we expect a certain kind of relationship, right? Like we have this expression here that tells us we expect this kind of temperature dependence. So let's measure a thing at a bunch of different temperatures and then fit a model to it that has the same temperature dependence, the one over T. And it, it could have, the 10 to the fourth could have been kept out and these could all just say, you know, whatever, nine times 10 to minus four, 10 times 10 to minus four. Yeah, so I was going to say, like, what's the point of, like, doing, like, I guess, writing it that way? Like, is it just because of, like, a huge temperature, like, um, it's like range? dealer's choice, you know, it's aesthetics, in my opinion. Because <laughs> I'm it, like, that makes it write, look a little bit more confused. Yeah, if you had to write like times 10 to minus four, times 10 to minus four, times 10 to minus four, and every single one, it yeah. would look messier. So it's just like, a, you know, this is like a nice looking chart with like ones and twos. And, you yeah. Know. So I it's see. that simple. Okay, so here's another example. And this is a thermal barometer um, that is used all the time. Uh, here in Hawaii, and this has to do with the solid substitution of olivine for uh, phosphorite and thalite, as we've been talking about. And it's basically, it's a, we've already looked at that chemical reaction, so I'm not going to you know, write it out again for you, but this is clipped straight out of the book. Uh, Magnesium-rich olivine can react with iron in the liquid, meaning the magma that it's sitting in to make an iron-rich olivine and exchange magnesium into the liquid. And we get some proportion. And here in Hawaii, most of our olivines are in the kind of FO80 to FO90 range, which means they're 80 to 90% fat and like 10 to 20% fat. And that's just, that's common. And when we get into, um, you know, magmas that are more differentiated, we can get lower values. But for places like this, that's what we get. And um, again, these things, people can measure a whole bunch of chemical equilibrium situations where all they're doing is varying temperature, keeping the pressure constant, and then parameterize it with a one over T relationship. And they can come up with these expressions for the mole fraction of magnesium and the olivine, magnesium in the liquid, which are things we can measure on the microprobe downstairs, or iron. In a liquid over, um, you know, excuse me, iron and olivine over iron and liquid, or the whole distribution coefficient, which is basically just a mixture of those two things. And then again, this is just a diagram sort of showing you the mole fraction of, of olivine, uh, of iron in the liquid, um, and the mole fraction of magnesium in the liquid parameterized for um, one over T, and then basically lines of specific um, mixtures on there, right? So the 90-10 mixture is 90% magnesium, 10% iron. This thing over here, 20-80 is 20% of that stuff and 80% of that stuff. And, and then we can pick temperatures out. And so this is a kind of a common thing. We should just get reproduced again. We'll do a homework assignment, taking some numbers and solving it this way. So look at that in the book. White has a little example of how to do it in Excel, which I'm going to suggest that you follow. So you can set up when I give you the assignment, you'll see, but you basically follow his example, make yourself a little spreadsheet, and then calculate for a couple of scenarios 
what you think the temperature is on the basis of these values, which you calculate from the table of data. He, he shows you how to do it. But so it's another example of something that responds to temperature and in a really obvious way. And so we can use it as a paleo thermometer. Now, one of the critical things to recognize about this stuff, maybe it's already, you've already realized it, but in all these cases, we have to assume chemical equilibrium. Right. And that is an actually pretty weak assumption in most situations in the earth sciences. A lot of processes are slow, they're dynamic. Just think about, for instance, these kinds of parameterizations assume isobaric, meaning constant pressure situations. Think about all of being growing in a magma, it's starting in a magma chamber, the magma is coming up through the conduit, it erupts on the surface. That's a big drop in pressure. That's going to affect the distribution. So what we're kind of hoping for is um, something that's less precise than exactly the right number um, and more precise than not knowing anything at all, right? And, and like I said, we make some assumptions and in some cases they're better than others. We can look at the minerals. We tend to try to go for so small, simple grains and ones that we think maybe the conditions were frozen in at a certain depth as things come up through the conduit. We'll talk about this a lot more later in the semester, but I just, you know, I think it's important to, to consider this stuff with a grain of salt. There's um, a researcher um, who has developed a body of research about using this particular thing that a lot of other people cite. It basically tries to make the argument that the temperature in the mantle at which basalts are produced around the world in places like Hawaii, Iceland, and mid-ocean ridges, et cetera, et cetera, can, you can characterize the temperature of the melting region um, on the basis of these kinds of simple arguments. And they further make the case that places like Hawaii, which is a hot spot, have a really big excess of temperature. But the problem is, is with that, and it might, it might be right, there may be some hints to that, but there's a bunch of other stuff that can change this chemistry, one of which is the fact that iron can oxidize from plus two to plus three, and then it doesn't substitute in according to this simple uh, equation, because this is for the plus two ions. And just not knowing the relative proportion of iron three to iron two in your mixture can completely throw this whole thing off. So there's a lot more that you need to know than just these simple things to actually um, have confidence in the answers. So as I say, you got to take these with a little bit of a grain of salt because there's always something more to this than the simplification in most thermometers and barometers. But they exist. There's one other example. And so this one is not an igneous example. This is a low temperature geochemistry example. So if you think about calcifying organisms, corals, foraminifera, stuff that make calcium carbonate shells, it turns out that as they're precipitating the, that shell from their biological uh, membranes, they take chemicals out of the water they're living in. It could be seawater, it could be fresh water, but in this example, I'm thinking seawater. And they make their shell and they put in small amounts of other ions. So in calcium carbonate, it's really common to put in strontium and magnesium, the two elements sitting on either side of calcium. It also turns out for kind of slightly different reasons, you can also substitute in uranium. I don't want to get into the details of how that works, but it, it happens. There are other elements that substitute in as well. And they substitute it in as a variation in temperature, okay? So that if we, if you recall back to last time I mentioned, there's two different forms of calcium carbonate. There's aragonite and there's calcite. Aragonite has a slightly more open structure. It's the kind of shell that, uh, or the kind of skeletal element that corals make, for instance. It's got a better relationship than um, uh, calcium carbonate in the form of calcite. So these are different forms of corals, uh, all of the, um, genus Parites, which is very common here in Hawaii. We have a lot of Parites lobata um, and some Parites shikita. And, you know, you can see that it's, it's a little bit messy. It varies from different species of coral to different species of coral, but there's a general relationship here that says that as the temperature goes down, we get more substitution of strontium into that. Here. Okay. Now, this is even more complicated than the last example because we have biological growth effects. Right, like you could have a coral that's just like very slowly growing in chemical equilibrium with the water, or some change happens 
uh, biologically to that coral, maybe it's having a, a heat stress event or whatever, it's still making shale, it's still growing, but it may not be incorporating strontium in exact chemical equilibrium conditions anymore. But in any event, there's still some kind of relationship here. It, like for the blue dots, which are for this Paragnetitea, it's a, like a better relationship. And so this is what people have found. There are some species of coral that are pretty useful that we can go back and look at old corals that we radiocarbon date and say, oh, well, how has the temperature of the ocean changed? And because corals put down annual bands like tree rings, we can actually take a coral head and it's not uncommon for these forms of parietes to live for hundreds of years. You can find individual coral heads that are hundreds of years old. Take a sample, count the tree rings, measure strontium in them. You can get an annual record if you want. You can see, well, how has sea surface temperature changed? Has it changed over the last hundred years? Has it changed over the last, uh, that was you, yeah, I think that was no much. worries. Uh, over the last thousand years, um, whatever, by, by kind of building up a record. And so this has been kind of an important part of, um, you know, our understanding of um, paleoclimate in the recent past. Even though it's kind of imperfect, it still gives us some idea of some variations. And so even if you can't get the exact value out, you can get relative variations. You can look, and so one of the things, ways this has been used is to look at the um, kind of prevalence of El Nino and La Nina events in the Pacific going back in time. All from something as simple as the strontium substitution into, um, into aragonite calcium carbonate. Okay, so the other kind of mixtures that we find are mixtures of phases, physically different phases that we find. Um, so these are not in solution with each other. These are discrete phases as a function of temperature and pressure. And this is one of my favorite ones. This is for this really simple Al2SiO5 chemical, which can be found in three phases, andalusite, sylmanite, and kyanite, as a function of different temperature and pressure. And I, I kind of fell in love with this phase diagram back when I was a grad student. There's a place in California where within about 50 meters of each other, you can find all three of these phases present in the outcrop along a temperature gradient in an ancient fault zone at the southern part of the Sierra Nevadas. Um, they're all, you know, very nice looking minerals. This one is nicer looking than either of these two, in my opinion. But um, the fact that we find any two of these two minerals present in um, a rock, and again, let, let's just make the caveat for um, we're assuming chemical equilibrium. If we found analucite kyanite, it means we've got to be somewhere along this line, right? Because they're there together at chemical equilibrium. If we're on this line, we got analucite and sylmanite. If we're on this line, we've got kyanite and sylmanite. And of course, this dot it somehow, you know, like in that case um, in the Southern Sierras, then or close to this dot then we know that we must have been, when those rocks formed and, and froze in their mineral composition, about this temperature, about that, that pressure. And there are other examples that we find in the literature of cases or, you know, where um, we have, you know, simple relationships like this. The kinetics of this exchange is slow, right? So it's possible you could also have physical mixtures that of some of these minerals in a rock that are not at chemical equilibrium. So you have to do a lot of petrography to convince yourself that it's right. But um, it's, a, it's another kind of mixture that is used sometimes to tell temperature and pressure. Okay, so that's mixtures. Now I want to go in and talk about non ideality. I keep throwing this term out, so now I kind of want to help define it a little bit better for you. Um, what do we mean when stuff behaves non-ideally? And here's this is not in the, um, the PDF notes that I put up yesterday because I added this uh, after I put it up. But I'll put up a new version with the minute. These are just a couple of graphics that kind of illustrate what we're talking about. So in this graphic here, we've got composition A and B. Again, like a mixture, right? We got we think about the iron and the magnesium, the olivine example we're talking about. We can have you know, a lot of one or a lot of other, it doesn't matter, but we, we can express this as a fraction. And these are different scenarios, okay, of what happens to the Gibbs free energy of phase A and phase B in the mixture as a function of how things change, right? So in each case, the ideal is a dashed line. In an ideal case where the chemicals are not interacting with each other or other stuff in the system, 
there is no effect on the energetics of the entire material as we mix across from A to B. So that's why this dashed line is a horizontal line in all cases. But you can see here all sorts of other crazy scenarios here where in reality, we can have cases where um, the Gibbs free energy of the material changes in a simple linear way or a parabolic way or in these even more complicated ways. And it, we're not going to get into the details of this particular formulation right now, but it's only to say that, like in this case, for instance, you can see that as we're mixing our two end members A and B together, there are certain compositions where the energy is minimized. Nature likes to minimize energy in chemical reactions. And so these would be favorable chemicals that we might find mixtures in these particular proportions. And in between, this thing blows up to a really high energy, which is a really unfavorable mixture. Um, and this is sort of like a reduced version of it here. But the point being that if we have a theory to understand why it is that chemicals would follow different pathways as they mix, we can correct for the non-ideality and get a better result in however we're using the mixture, whether it's you know thermometry and barometry or some other situation. So this over here is just another example. This one is um, showing you the vapor pressure of a gas over um, a liquid that it's dissolved into as a function of uh, mixing um, the two gases together. So let's say, for instance, we have water vapor, and the water vapor has some oxygen 16 and some oxygen 18, which are two of the different isotopes of oxygen. We'll talk about isotopes later. 16 is the primary isotope, 18 is um, a relatively small fraction of the total, but the water molecules behave differently because they have these different uh, heavy and light isotopes. So if we mix them together, if we have like pure water, which is pure oxygen 16, or water with pure oxygen 18, and we mix them together, um, if they were ideal and ideal gases, then we would expect that the properties of the mixture would follow along some kind of ideal line that is um, assumes that there's no uh, kind of energy difference between them. But in fact, what we find oftentimes is that the, the pressure goes up as, as we get some mixtures kind of somewhere in the middle. Again, we can make a correction for this. We can calculate what it is. In this case, because we're talking about gases, activity gets a special name called fugacity, and I'll show you an example of this in a second, but it's still basically just an activity. And this deviation shown schematically here is for the amount of non-ideality. So we can see that the non-ideality in the system increases when we get to something like you know, a 50-50 mole fraction. It's not as bad when we're over by the end, but when we get to the middle, something looks different from what we would predict. So, you know, just taking a step back, what do we mean by non-ideality? Non-ideality really means that the things that we're looking at, the chemicals, are behaving in a way that's different than we would have predicted. Right? And they can behave differently for a whole bunch of different reasons. We're talking about things with charges on them. Things with charges can interact with each other electrostatically. So by Coulomb's law, there's going to be maybe, for instance, a repulsion by, by similarly charged ions. They're not going to like that. That can give it introduced non-ideality. Think about gases. Some molecules and gases are small or atoms. Some of them are big. Some of them have a lot of charges on their surfaces. So as we start to turn up the pressure, some gas molecules are going to interact with other like gas molecules or of other chemicals differently than we might expect. They don't. It's almost like having a bunch of rubber balls that are not perfectly um, symmetrical in how bouncy they are in all directions. But when they touch each other, they um, sometimes don't bounce in the trajectory we would expect. For each different kind of system and for each different kind of chemical, we can calculate a deviation from idealness called a non-ideality factor. Non-ideality factor, sometimes also called an activity coefficient, it's given the Greek letter gamma. Okay. And so when we talk about gammas, <clears throat> these are a fraction of the chemical activity that is present that tells us how much is behaving like it's actually there. So the way this works is that a gamma 
is one, then the chemical is ideal. Let's say gamma were 0.5. That would mean that in that situation, the chemical present is acting like only half of the amount that's there is actually involved in the chemical reaction. It means the other half is doing something else. You can also find gammas that are greater than one, right? Like you have, that happens in gases all the time where at high pressure, uh, we have a certain amount of gas and we have an activity coefficient of like 1.5, which means that that gas is acting like, like it's present one and a half times as much as is actually present. And so th these factors, sometimes they can be predicted, sometimes they can be parameterized and measured. Um, so this is like another example, a really simple example of activity um, <clears throat> for a classroom with one instructor and four students, right? So in the ideal case, which is up here, you know, you've got the instructor, blah, 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 and you've got four students, they're all paying attention. <coughs> like the activity of students in that class is four, right? So there's four students. Now you come down here, blah, 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 instructor, you know, talking to one student, paying attention, three of them are doing something else, right? On the phone, sleeping. In this case, the activity of students in the class is one, right? Three of them are doing something else. So this would have an activity coefficient, a gamma of 0.25, okay? And I know this is, you know, kind of a trite example, but this is exactly how actual activity works. So if you think about situations where chemicals are behaving like, there's less of them present than is actually present. Just go back to this analogy. It means they're doing something else. So something else is probably not sleeping, but in natural environments, chemicals can be involved in other kinds of maybe unpredictable interactions or not predicted in an ideal case that makes them act like they're not available to participate in the chemical reaction. And so only some fraction is there. That is activity in a nutshell. So the first example I'll give you is in pressure. Right. So everyone knows, hopefully, from your kind of chemistry at some point, that in an ideal gas, the partial pressure of any chemical I is basically the mole fraction of I times the total pressure. Think about our atmosphere, which is you know approximately seventy-eight percent oxygen, excuse me, nitrogen, and um, twenty percent or 21% oxygen and the rest is argon, then the partial pressure of argon would be the mole fraction of argon times the total pressure. So here, at, you know, the surface of the Earth, uh, one atmosphere of pressure, the partial pressure of argon in the atmosphere would just be its fraction of the total, right? Something like 3%. And in cases where gases are not ideal, which doesn't happen so much here in our atmosphere at room temperature at sea level, but it happens all the time when we crank up the pressure of the temperature. If you can think about at a volcano or something like that, then this simple rule doesn't apply anymore. The reason it doesn't apply is because of this, right? Some of those gas molecules at high pressure are like not behaving like the typical gas. They're doing something else. And we don't care what the something else is for now. But so we can figure out what the non-ideality is and try and parameterize it again using chemical potential, thinking about the chemical potential of gas I in our mixture as the chemical potential of the pure phase plus some deviation for the relative amount of I in the, of, in the total mix and derive a parameterization for non-ideality in this case, which in the case of pressures, we call the activity fugacity. It's just like another term, but you know, sometimes people talk about fugacities, they're really just talking about the non-ideal pressure of a gas. So in most cases, the fugacity of a gas is less than its actual pressure meaning that the activity coefficient is somehow less than one, some fraction of the gas molecules are doing something else than what we would expect so that we come up with this kind of scenario here, okay? And there are systems to estimate what these are for different kinds of scenarios. Um, they tend to need to be um, measured experimentally because gases and molecules that, that end up making the gases that are common in a lot of systems that we're interested in 
are not simple gas molecules. They're not stuff like O2 and N2. They're stuff like CO2 and water, which have very complicated chemistry when they dissolve and silicate melts, for instance. And it's hard to estimate what these are from first principles. So instead, we parameterize. We make a mixture of you know, basaltic melts, for instance, at different temperatures and pressures. And we put them in equilibrium with some water and some CO2. And we see how much is in there relative to how much we put in. And then we can calculate a deviation from IDL. Um, so the kinds of ways that people use fugacity instead of pressure um, is where it really starts to matter. So we're talking about you know, igneous chemistry, or we're talking about metamorphism of crustal rocks. Think about like you know, a hot water-rich fluid shooting through a rock, um, and it has a certain amount of dissolved carbon in it, which um, can equilibrate with CO2, and that's going to set um, the ability of that fluid to do transformations to make some carbonate minerals in the rock. Um, high pressure geothermal fluids, all of these are cases where um, if we're making any kind of calculations or observations um, that include gases that, that have a pressure dependent character to them, that we're probably going to see fugacity be really different than the actual pressure of the chemicals that are present. Okay, especially when we get to pressures that are what we call lithostatic. Lithostatic is basically just the pressure as we go down with depth. Sorry, uh, as we go down with depth. Um, the pressure related to, let's see if I can make this work. Um, yeah, um, to the overlying rock above it. So when pressures get really high, um, then we get into these non ideal states. Okay, and we get this divergence between F and P. More common thing, and this is what we'll spend the rest of the time talking about today, is non ideality in aqueous solutions. And again, in aqueous solutions, we can have non ideality as a function of. Um, different kinds of solutes. So salts, ionically charged things, have a different kind of non-ideality than uh, covalently bonded things like carbohydrates and how they dissolve in the water. We're going to mostly focus on um, salts because we have a pretty good model for predicting how that works. So again, there's a chemical potential argument we can make. So for instance, we can compare pure salt water, sodium chloride, to seawater, which has got some magnesium sulfate in it and some other ions as well. And we can look at how the actual behavior of ions in those solutions deviates from the ideal mixture, if they deviate at all, as a function of things like charge on the ion or size of the ion or what have you. And we can develop up a theory using chemical potential again that looks at the, the you know, energetics, the gets free energy um, of an individual chemical as a function of being in a mixture, so it's fraction of the total relative to being pure. And in this case here, we have an activity coefficient, um, gamma, which operates on the concentration in solution, usually expressed in molalities instead of molarities. This is like a subtle thing, but when you um, learn chemistry in a chemistry class and they assume everything is ideal, you pretty much always use molarity moles per liter of substance, because um, in most cases, they're assuming near infinite dilution, meaning that the volume of the water is what we would predict from the mass of the water, because there's so little solute in there that it doesn't affect it. But in our case, that doesn't really work anymore. Like seawater has roughly three and a half grams of salt for every thousand grams of water that's in there. Like, uh, you know, three uh, percent, three and a half percent deviation. And so the, the real um, scenario is in molality, we're looking at moles per kilogram of solution instead of moles per liter of solution. And we have to make that distinction because we have enough dissolved solute in there that molality is the more um, accurate way of describing that solution. All right, so. <clears throat> There's a theory for how we express non-ideality in aqueous solutions, which I'm going to build up for you now. And the first thing that it depends on is charge-based interactions between ions. Sodium ions, magnesium ions are both positively charged. They get next to each other. They repel each other. They don't like that. If we increase the concentration of salt, we get more and more of those interactions. Those interactions cause some of those ions to be, quote, unquote, sleeping. Um, and so therefore not part of 
the um, kind of the total ionic load that's present. So one of the things that we use to understand non-ideality in solutions where we have ionic solutes is to, to express um, the concentration, total concentration of salt in solution with something called I ionic strength. All ionic strength is, is the sum of the molality times the charge squared of every ion in solution added up across a solution. I'm giving you some values here. So I of typical seawater is about 0.7. I of typical river water is about 0.1 or 0.15. We can get into situations really briny uh, kinds of like geothermal fluids, for instance, um, where I you know, can go up to three or four or five. And so all I is, is all of the charges, right, in solution. And the reason that we have Z, the charge on the ion square, is because of Coulomb's law, which is also tells us that the interaction between charged particles varies as the square of the charge and the radius of the distance of interaction between them. And the reason we have one half here is because we're summing up all the cations and all the anions, and then we're going to divide by two to account for the net. So if you were solving a problem with this and you had a bunch of salts in solution, you would basically look up their molality. So you look at the ion and look at its charge. It's got a charge of one, it's just going to go in here as one. So if you've got a charge of two, right? Two squared is four. Uh -oh. Uh, oh, okay. Well, I got to put this on pause and run downstairs and get my power cord. I'll be right back. Think about it. It's like the end of uh, petrology. Oh, yeah. Already been off in the stereo. Oh, it was a gibbet, right? Uh, yeah. What is that? Seven. I don't actually remember the end of petrology. What do you remember? Yeah. I remember the labs. <laughs> it's the only thing I remember. That's such a wild statement for me here. All right. So If I can make it before it turns off. I have to contend with not tripping on this. All right. So, this ionic strength is an important parameter in our model. We'll use ionic strength again and again. So, just for a moment, that it's, it's an important parameter. And so, you can say, well, why do we care about that? Because the higher the saltiness of a solution, the more our ions are doing something other than we thought they should be doing. So the greater the activity deviates from the actual molality. And then an example of, for instance, how much calcium carbonate can we put in the ocean? How does that vary as a function of saltiness of the ocean? Right? If we melt a lot of glacier and the seawater in the surface of the oceans gets fresher, what does that do to the solubility, for instance? So we can write out a solubility product, which is just the moles of calcium and the moles of carbonate for the dissolution of calcium carbonate. And at low ionic strength, meaning kind of river water ionic strength, the non-ideality is such that the solubility product is a close approximation of reality. But at seawater ionic strength, what we measure in reality when we make the measurements of the exact dissolved magnesium, excuse me, calcium and carbonate at equilibrium is less than the amount of moles of stuff that's been put in there. Again, because some of the ions of calcium and carbonate are asleep, going back to that students in the classroom example. And so this deviation is important. It's important enough 
If we don't correct for it, we get the wrong answer. When, for instance, we want to look at um, various features involved in the preservation of calcium carbonate in marine sediments and what that tells us about what the climate was like in the past. So you can say, well, where does this gamma come from exactly? It's a quantification of the non ideality. And in this case, you know, it works for any solute and any solvent, solvent being the main phase and the solute being the things that are substituting in, in aqueous solutions, especially for charged ions in aqueous solutions. These are the things that cause things to be non ideal. We've got charge interactions between the ions. That's where that Z square thing comes from. You can have the diameter of the ion, right? A huge ion is going to have a different kind of disruption from a small ion. Um, the solvent itself can um, stabilize charge. So water has what we call a high dielectric constant. That's because it's got those polar ends to it that we've already talked about. So it can stabilize charge more than other kinds of uh, media that we put charged substances into. But nevertheless, this affects how ideal or non-ideal things behave. And then other ions, right? So you can imagine in this case I give you here, when we stick calcium and carbonate in water, we add more and more and more to it at higher ionic strength. Just the fact that calcium and carbonate are present and doing things other than what they're supposed to be doing with each other causes this deviation. But if we then stick in a bunch of other salts, sodium and chlorine and magnesium, whatever, then we can get even greater deviations in this, partly because of differences in charge and size of all the ions that are in the mix. So this is an example from your textbook showing you three kinds of interactions between a cation and an anion, cation, anion, and all these little beach balloons around them are water molecules, right? So this is a hydrated cation with four water molecules right next to it, um, pointing their negative end to help stabilize that positive charge, plus the more waters around it to help also stabilize the charge. This is an anion versus chloride ion, and the waters are pointing their positive end to it. And so you can see here that these ions are pretty much shielded from interacting with each other too much by having a bunch of water around, right? But in this case here, and in this case here, these ions get closer and closer and they act like a unit, okay? So we call this an ion pair. It's not, it's not a compound, it's not like sodium chloride compound. Instead, it's a loose affiliation of chemicals in solution, collectively hydrated, but because these guys are here together in this ion pair, they're asleep from the perspective of the students in the classroom example. These two things are busy doing this, so they're not busy just being sodium ions and chloride ions in solution. And as I say, you can get these different kinds of interactions. They depend on the size and shape of the ion. So when we come down here to these really big ions, right, like cesium and like with iodine, you don't tend to see this very often because there are geometric reasons why it's not stable. You tend to see this more. So this gradient can be as a function of size can also be the function of charge, right? So if we have a plus one and a minus one cation, they may mix nicely like that, but if we got like a plus three cation and a minus four anion, they may not, again, mix uh, so closely in this kind of ion pairing relationship, they make this kind instead. And the only reason that we care about this distinction of these different kinds of ion pairs is that they do affect the non-ideality a little bit, and you can measure how much of these different things are present spectroscopically in solution. So at high ionic strength, turn up the salt content, we get a bunch of different ion pairs. And the higher the ionic strength, the saltier the solution, the more that happens. There's a mixture of calcium chloride and magnesium sulfate. Um, stick them in there and increase the concentration that we put into the water. We're going to transition from having almost all pure ions. They're just in solution by themselves, ideally with an activity close to that concentration. To getting higher and higher concentrations of ion pairs. And these are some of the ion pairs in the present. It's basically just, yes, magnesium parks next to some chlorines and calcium parks next to some chlorine. When magnesium parks next to two chlorines, 
when calcium peroxide is through chlorine, the magnesium peroxide is through sulfate, the calcium is through sulfate. And just go back to this example and think about what that means. In, in, in one of the, these three cases, the ion pairs the two things together. And that means because they're doing that, they're not going to do other kinds of chemical reactions. And I just also want to point out that when I write something like this, magnesium chloride two to the zero, that's not the same thing as saying magnesium chloride. It's an ion pair. Sometimes people write these with brackets on them, but these are something that isn't necessarily predicted by simple chemical thermodynamics, but it exists in actual nature. And the way we try to, since it's not predicted by thermodynamics, there isn't a simple model or theory that we can use to say, well, how much of that happens? Instead, we got to measure how much of it happens and then try and make some sense out of the variability. And the very first model for this, for parameterizing it, was called the bi -Hugel. And in this simple theory, which it ends up not being very good, so you got to make some modifications to it. But it starts out by saying minus log of the activity coefficient, the gamma, the thing that's a fraction of the total, is some constant A, okay? It's just a constant times the charge squared, and remember where that comes from, Coulomb's law, and the ionic strength of the solution to the one half. So this is basically telling us that in this formulation, the bi Google is sitting around drinking beer one day and they say, hey man, maybe the non-ideality is entirely due to charge, right? And this is just a term that tells us how salty our solution is. So the individual charge on individual ions, I is each individual ion, times the total saltiness of the solution, charge squared to the Coulomb's law, and some kind of constant, um, and it turns out that this constant is temperature dependent and it's related to the solvent and it has a lot to do with the dielectric constant of the solution. So for instance, in water at 25 degrees C, it's about 0.5 in this formulation. So you just think about this as 0.5. So this is a way of saying, well, maybe you can predict the gamma based on these really simple things, the charge and the saltiness of the solution. It works okay, but it doesn't work ideal. Okay. So this is the measurements of actual changes in activity coefficient, right, um, as a function of going from an ionic strength of zero up to one or two. That's a pretty narrow range of ionic strength, right? It's like, you know, 50% saltier to seawater, maybe three times the seawater. And you can see that this is what would be ideal, meaning no interaction. And for most ionic species, their activity goes down as a function of increasing salt content, okay? Now, for other kinds of chemicals, um, neutrally charged things, the bi theory doesn't work at all. Right? For things like, well, how much oxygen is dissolved, or nitrogen, or methane? They follow a different sort of systematics. They actually act like more of them is present than is actually present. Ryan talked about that in detail, but um, there is a theory for this as well. I'm just using the bi to illustrate because it's such a dramatic effect. So, this is a more blown up chart. This goes up to really super high ionic strengths, right? And you can see here that for different ionic pairs in solution, magnesium sulfate, lanthanum chloride, calcium chloride, sodium chloride, this is what the actual value of gamma that's been measured in these solutions. Um, and you can see that magnesium has a huge effect, right? Like when we're down here, this gamma is 0.05. It bottoms out at 0.05. That means that only 5% of the magnesium that is present in solution is not asleep. The rest of it is involved in the ion pair and it can't do all the other stuff magnesium would do in solution because it's got such a strong restriction on its behavior by non ideality Where sodium chloride isn't too bad, right? And this gives us a kind of a hint. Sodium chloride, this is a plus one ion and a minus one ion. This is a plus two ion and a minus two ion. It's a compound ion. It's really big on sulfur and poor oxygen. So something about size and charge is what's causing this disruption. And it turns out that this, the bi theory, isn't quite good enough. It doesn't even include a parameter for size. Right? It's got a thing for charge, but it doesn't have a thing for size. And so that brings us to an extended version of the bi -Hugel. Okay. <clears throat> and so, um, and again, this is described in a textbook in some amount of detail. So there's a bunch of different theories for extended the bi -Hugel, right? And they're all just parameterizations. And I'm also going to have you do a homework assignment where you calculate some activity coefficients for different things. And this is a table that shows you the major ions in seawater. As a starting point, you can see you know, how much of it is um, 
chloride and sodium and magnesium two plus ions and sulfate, et cetera, et cetera, expressed in weight units and in millimolar units, right? And I've added in percent. And you can see here the amount that's free, right? So this is ionic strength of 0.7. It's not too bad yet for the ion carrying, but you can already see here that the chlorine, yeah, it's got an activity coefficient of basically one because most of the ion is behaving like it should. We come down to this case here for sulfate, activity coefficient of 0.4 or 0.39, basically. Only 39% of the ion is behaving like a free ion that's there to involve itself in chemical reaction. So for instance, we're looking at the substitution of magnesium ions into calcium carbonate to tell us something about um, you know, paleo conditions uh, that that carbonate grew in. We have to make a correction for the fact that you know, yeah, about 10%, 11% of the magnesium is present in the solution isn't acting like it's present because of that activity coefficient. So you can actually calculate an ionic strength of seawater using these things, right? It's just the charge squared and the molality, sum them all up times a half. And you can do that using the information here. And then you can apply one or another of these extended to bifocal theory. So this one here is called the Truesdale Jones equation. It, this remember if we just take this denominator out, that's the bifocal. So this adds in some other stuff in the bifocal, a second constant and a value of A, which has to do with the size. <clears throat> okay. And so you can get those numbers here off this table and you can see that they're temperature dependent. Right. So it lumps in a bunch of elements together and says, yeah, we got a bunch of size categories. And there's different values of B that have been measured in a solution. So you can stick these things in and you can predict the activity coefficient. You can also do it with this other slightly different parameter for based on the Davies equation. And the Davies equation, they simplified somewhere in between True Cell Jones and the Bifugal. They just put this extra term in here for ionic strength. In the textbook, he uses 0.3. I've seen it as 0.2. It doesn't, it doesn't matter so much, but basically, again, you can look numbers up in the book for the constant and calculate activity coefficients. Uh, where are we? Okay. So this is this, uh, the last slide I'll show you. This is from the book. It just shows you the prediction of gamma, okay, as a function of ionic strength, right? Remember, seawater is about 0.7, so it's down over here, this little part of the curve. Um, and it shows you how these theories deviate from each other. So if we're talking about really solutions like seawater, whatever, all three of these things work pretty much the same, right? There isn't a huge amount of difference. They only start to matter a lot when we get into solutions that are really different from uh, seawater with really salty concentrations, geothermal brines, for instance. Then, then you can see that these three parameterizations give very different results. And in this particular case, um, this is, you know, magnesium chloride ions in a solution of magnesium chloride. Trusdell Jones equation seems to work the best. Whatever. Um, as I say, um, in the cases that we'll be working with, any one of these would work, but I'll have you do a calculation where you compare these two results uh, for one solution, just so you can see what's going on. So the last little thing that's left me here that I didn't get to today is just a calculation of how um, non-ideality affects the solubility of calcium carbonate. You can look at those last couple of slides yourself. It's a really straightforward, uh, excuse me, cal calcium chloride. It's a really straightforward uh, calculation. So I'll leave it there and ask if you have questions.